it often isn't. And you can't, here's the thing, you can't take a mediocre steak and make it great just by aging it. It's just not gonna work. The last thing I wanna talk in terms of the mistakes we make is we impose the grape model on beef. We're used to talking about grapes as they relate to wine. Uh, this is kind of our lens of connoisseurship, and it's the vocabulary we have to think of things like provenance. Uh, but there's a couple of problems with it. We talk an awful lot about breeds, and there can be a danger in that. Th the first danger is that the varieties of grapes are all far more different from each other than breeds of cattle are from each other. The other problem is that the varieties of grapes are very tight genetically. A lot of them are clones. So there is far more variation within a breed. We talk about breeds like Angus and Hereford. There's tremendous variation within them. When you talk to cattle people, they talk about particular lines of Angus or Hereford. So breed does not inform the eating experience with beef the way it does with wine. And the biggest reason, even more so than the genetics factor, is the fact that plants and animals are different in one very fundamental way. <laughs> Grapes make all their own flavor. A grape is physiologically responsible for getting its flavor into its flesh. That's not how it works with cattle. And that begs the all important question. I think the question of why we're here today is where does flavor come from in beef? And I want to tell you a story that I had while writing this book. I became friends with a guy, he's a, a brain scientist. He studies lipid metabolism in the brain. And I phoned him up one day to ask him some questions about what are omega-3s, why are they good for you, and so forth. And this guy happens to be a huge foodie. So he was thrilled to meet this guy who's running a book on steak, and he volunteered to help me eat some steaks, which he did. But he also volunteered to run some fatty acid profiles for me. So I gave him four different kinds of steak, because you can tell a lot about what a cow's been eating by its fat, and he ran the profiles. But before he ran the profiles, he phoned me up. He was almost panicked. He said, you're not going to believe what happened. He ran the extraction, so he extracted all the fat from the beef, and the four samples, the fat all looked different. When the fat was extracted, suddenly you could see things in it that you couldn't see when you were just looking at the steak. So the four samples were, one was commodity, which is just one of these heavily grain-fed, average $10 steaks you buy at the butcher shop. One was my cow, who you saw the picture of. One was a grass-fed Wagyu cow from uh, a little island near Seattle, and one was a grass-fed bison cattle hybrid from Washington State, from the mountains. And this is what they looked like. This is the one on the far left, A1, was the commodity. Completely clear. I mean, you could literally see the blandness. But the interesting thing, the interesting thing is, those three other ones, the color kind of corresponded to the flavor. The brightest, sweetest steak was my, my own cow, which is B1. The most resonant, deepest, beefiest steak was C1, that was that bison hybrid. It's, you can literally see the color, and what you're seeing there are organic compounds. They're things that are in the food that cattle eat, and where you find those is in this stuff. It's in grass. And that's why people talk about things like grass-fed beef. That's why people talk about what did the cow eat. They, they sound like pretentious questions, like you'd see someone making fun of on Portlandia, but the truth <laughs> is it makes an enormous difference. That's why people like me care about what did that cow eat. There's, so there's two things. Flavor in beef is a product of two things. It's a product, most importantly, of diet. And the second thing is age. And no one, that is why so much beef sucks now. Because everyone wants to speed it up. They want to get the cattle fat by pounding a lot of grain down their throat. And what we lose is flavor. But if you do take your time, and you let it happen properly, you can feed cattle grass and you can get them very fat, and here I am, still obsessed with marble. <laughs> so I think we're actually gonna eat, I, I don't know which one it is, but we'll be sampling this very type of beef later on. So the last thing I wanna to talk to you about, because we're gonna do a tasting shortly, is how to think about steak. Now the most important thing, we have these scorecards, and you are gonna be thinking about things like um, the length of the finish, the complexity, the sustained flavor intensity. These are important things to think about, but the most important thing I want you guys to think about is do I like this? Don't look at that scorecard until you've had one bite. Because the important thing is how does a steak make you feel? How does it light up your brain? It's a visceral reaction. It's, it can be helpful to analytically think of things like tenderness, juiciness, but really it's how you feel. That's the most important thing. The other thing I want, when we talk about flavor, it, it sometimes helps to think about it because I think so, much, so many of us have eaten bland steak for so long we almost don't know what to think about. So 
What I would ask you to look for in terms of flavor is not just intensity, but things like the finish. What I found separates a good steak from a not so good steak in terms of flavor is an average steak, it hits you with some beef up front and then it dies. A good steak, it kind of tells a story. It, it builds in the palate and then it lingers. And it, it sort of, it, it, it's what they call in wines, it's the finish. It's what's the fade out like. Is it, is there, is it an acrid, unpleasant taste that's left on your tongue? Or is it kind of a gentle reminder of what it tasted like and that makes you want to go and have another bite? So think about that. The other thing I want to, I want to think about is the whole idea of best. It's a very challenging concept. What is the best steak? That's really why we're here today. What I found when I did the book is I had no idea what best meant by the end of it because people said, what's, what's your number one steak? You wrote the book on steak. And I feel like someone's asking me which of my three kids is the best one. Um, the truth is this is a journey. What I like in steak today isn't the same as it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago, and it keeps changing. So I don't know if there is for me an ultimate best. But I think there's a reason that we call things the best, and we say this is the best, because what we're trying to do is say, hey, look at this guy over here, look at what this person's doing over here, this is amazing. And I think that's what we're doing today. But I want everyone to think about the fact that what you love, think of it as a journey, we, we're gonna eat some great steak today, but you may, you know, your, your greatest steak may still be ahead of you, which is certainly a good reason to keep the journey moving. Um, and I think, we're getting close to me finally shutting up and everyone getting to eat steak. Um, Jeffrey, is there anything you want, want to say before we yes. embark on the tasting? There is. Did you, 